This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in April 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 26. Well, when they was all gone, the king, he asked Mary Jane how they was off for spare rooms, and she said she had one spare room which would do for Uncle William, and she'd give her own room to Uncle Harvey, which was a little bigger, and she would turn into the room with her sisters and sleep on a cot, and up garret was a little cubby with a pallet in it. The king said the cubby would do for his valley, meaning me. So Mary Jane took us up, and she showed them their rooms, which was plain but nice, she said she'd have her frocks and a lot of other traps took out of her room if they was in Uncle Harvey's way, but he said they warn't. The frocks was hung along the wall, and before them was a curtain made out of calico that hung down to the floor. There was an old hair trunk in one corner, and a guitar box in another, and all sorts of little knick-knacks and gym cracks around, like girls briskin' up a room with. The king said it was all the more homely and more pleasanter for these fixin's, and so don't disturb them. The duke's room was pretty small, but plenty good enough, and so was my cubby. That night they had a big supper, and all them men and women was there, and I stood behind the king in the duke's chairs and waited on them, and the niggers waited on the rest. Mary Jane, she sat at the head of the table, with Susan alongside her, and said how bad the biscuits was, and how mean the preserves was, and how ornery and tough the fried chickens was and all that kind of rot, the way women always do for to force out compliments, and the people all knowed everything was tip-top and said so, said, How do you get the biscuits to brown so nice? And, Where for the land's sake did you get these amazing pickles? And all that kind of humbug talky-talk, just the way people always does at a supper, you know. And when it was all done, me and the hare lip had supper in the kitchen off of the leavings, whilst the others was helping the niggers clean up the things. The hare lip, she got to pumpin' me about England, and blessed if I didn't think the ice was getting mighty thin sometimes. She says, Did you ever see the king? Who, William Fourth? Well, I bet I have. He goes to our church. I knowed he was dead years ago, but I never let on. So when I says he goes to our church, she says, What, regular? "'Yes, regular. His pew's right over opposite Arn, on the other side of the pulpit. "'I thought he lived in London. "'Well, he does. Where would he live? "'But I thought you lived in Sheffield. "'I see I was up a stump. "'I had to let on to get choked with a chicken bone "'so as to get time to think how to get down again. "'Then I says, "'I mean he goes to our church regular when he's in Sheffield.' "'That's only in the summertime when he comes there to take the sea baths. "'Why, how you talk! Sheffield ain't on the sea. "'Well, who said it was? Why, you did. "'I didn't another. You did. I didn't. You did. "'I never said nothing of the kind. "'Well, what did you say, then? "'Said he come to take the sea baths. That's what I said. "'Well, then, how's he going to take the sea baths if it ain't on the sea?' Look a here, I says. Did you ever see any Congress water? Yes. Well, did you have to go to Congress to get it? Why, no. Well, neither does William Fourth have to go to the sea to get a sea bath. How does he get it, then? Gets it the way people down here gets Congress water, in barrels. There in the palace at Sheffield, they've got furnaces, and he wants his water hot. They can't bile that amount of water away off there at the sea. They haven't got no conveniences for it. Oh, I see now. You might have said that in the first place and saved time. When she said that, I see I was out of the woods again, and so I was comfortable and glad. Next, she says, Do you go to church, too? Yes, regular. Where do you sit? Why, in our pew. Whose pew? Why, ourn, your Uncle Harvey's. Hisn? "'What does he want with a pew? "'Wants it to sit in. "'What do you reckon he want him with it? "'Why, I thought he'd be in the pulpit.' 
Rot him, I forgot he was a preacher. I see he was up a stump again. So I played another chicken bone and got another think. And I says, Blame it, do you suppose there ain't but one preacher to a church? Why, what do they want with more? What, to preach before a king? I never did see such a girl as you. They don't have no less than seventeen. Seventeen? My land! Why, I wouldn't set out such a string as that. Not if I never got to glory. It must take em a week. Shucks, they don't all of em preach the same day. Only one of em. Well, then, what does the rest of em do? Oh, nothing much. Loll around, pass the plate, and one thing or another. But mainly they don't do nothing. Well, then, what are they for? Why, they're for style. Don't you know nothing? Well, I don't want to know no such foolishness as that. How are servants treated in England? Do they treat em better and we treat our niggers? No, a servant ain't nobody there. They treat em worse than dogs. Don't they give em holidays the way we do? Christmas and New Year's week and Fourth of July? Oh, just listen. The body could tell you hain't ever been to England by that. Why, Herr, why, Joanna, they never see a holiday from year's end to year's end. Never go to the circus nor theater, nor nigger shows, nor nowheres. Nor church? Nor church. But you always went to church. Well, I was gone up again. I forgot I was the old man's servant. But next minute I whirled in on a kind of an explanation how a valley was different from a common servant, and had to go to church whether he wanted to or not, and set with the family, on account of its being the law. But I didn't do it pretty good, and when I got done, I see she warn't satisfied. She says, Honest Injun now, hain't you been telling me a lot of lies? Honest Injun, says I, none of it at all? None of it at all, not a lie in it, says I. Lay your hand on this book and say it. I see it warn't nothing but a dictionary, so I laid my hand on it and said it. So then she looked a little better satisfied and says, Well then, I'll believe some of it, but I hope to be gracious if I'll believe the rest. What is it you won't believe, Joe? says Mary Jane, stepping in with Susan behind her. It ain't right nor kind for you to talk so to him, and him a stranger and so far from his people. How would you like to be treated so? That's always your way, Mame, always sailing in to help somebody before they're hurt. I hain't done nothing to him. He's told some stretchers, I reckon, and I said I wouldn't swallow it all, and that's every bit and grain I did say. I reckon he can stand a little thing like that, can he? I don't care whether twas little or whether twas big. He's here in our house and a stranger, and it wasn't good of you to say it. If you was in his place, it would make you feel ashamed. "'and so you oughtn't to say a thing to another person "'that will make them feel ashamed. "'What, Mame, he said, "'It don't make no difference what he said. "'That ain't the thing. "'The thing is for you to treat him kind "'and not be saying things to make him remember "'he ain't in his own country and amongst his own folks. "'I says to myself, "'This is a girl that I'm letting that old reptile rob her of her money. "'Then Susan, she waltzed in, and if you'll believe me, she did give Harelip hark from the tomb. Says I to myself, And this is another one that I'm letting him rob her of her money. Then Mary Jane, she took another inning, and went in sweet and lovely again, which was her way. But when she got done, there weren't hardly anything left of poor Harelip. So she hollered. All right, then, says the other girls. You just ask his pardon. She done it, too. "'and she done it beautiful. "'She done it so beautiful it was good to hear, "'and I wished I could tell her a thousand lies "'so she could do it again. "'I says to myself, "'This is another one that I'm letting him rob her of her money, "'and when she got through, "'they all just laid theirselves to make me feel at home "'and know I was amongst friends. "'I felt so ornery and low down and mean "'that I says to myself, "'My mind's made up. I'll hive that money for them or bust. So then I lit out. For bed, I said, meaning some time or another. When I got by myself, I went to thinking the thing over. I says to myself, 
"'Shall I go to that doctor private and blow on these frogs?' "'No, that won't do. He might tell who told him. "'Then the king and the duke would make it warm for me. "'Shall I go private and tell Mary Jane?' "'No, I dasn't do it. "'Her face would give them a hint, sure. "'They've got the money, and they'd slide right out and get away with it. "'If she was to fetch in and help, I'd get mixed up in the business "'before it was done with, I judge. "'No, there ain't no good way but one.' I got to steal that money somehow, and I got to steal it some way that they won't suspicion that I done it. They've got a good thing here, and they ain't a goin' to leave till they've played this family and this town for all they're worth. So I'll find a chance time enough. I'll steal it and hide it, and by and by when I'm away down the river, I'll write a letter and tell Mary Jane where it's hid. But I better hive it tonight if I can, because the doctor. Maybe hasn't lit up as much as he lets on he has. He might scare them out of here yet. So, thinks I, I'll go and search them rooms. Upstairs the hall was dark, but I found the duke's room and started to paw around it with my hands, but I recollected it wouldn't be much like the king to let anybody else take care of that money but his own self. So then I went to his room and begun to paw around there, but I see I couldn't do nothing without a candle. "'and I doesn't light one, of course. "'So I judged I've got to do the other thing, "'lay for them an eavesdrop. "'About that time I hears their footsteps coming, "'and was going to skip under the bed. "'I reached for it, but it wasn't where I thought it would be. "'But I touched the curtain that hid Mary Jane's frocks, "'so I jumped in behind that and snuggled in amongst the gowns "'and stood there perfectly still. "'They come in and shut the door. "'and the first thing the duke done was to get down and look under the bed. "'Then I was glad I hadn't found the bed when I wanted it. "'And yet, you know, it's kind of natural to hide under the bed "'when you are up to anything private. "'They sits down then, and the king says, "'Well, what is it? "'And cut it middlin' short, because it's better for us to be down there "'whoopin' up the mornin' than up here giving them a chance to talk us over. "'Well, this is it, Capit. "'I ain't easy.' I ain't comfortable. That doctor lays on my mind. I wanted to know your plans. I've got a notion, and I think it's a sound one. What is it, Duke? That we better glide out of this before three in the morning and clip it down the river with what we've got, especially seeing we got it so easy, given back to us, flung at our heads, as you may say, when, of course, we allowed to have to steal it back. I'm for knocking off and lighting out. That made me feel pretty bad. About an hour or two ago it would have been a little different, but now it made me feel bad and disappointed. The king rips out and says, What? And that sell out the rest of the property? March off like a passel of fools and leave eight or nine thousand dollars worth of property laying around, just suffering to be scooped in? "'And all good saleable stuff, too?' "'The Duke, he grumbled, said the bag of gold was enough, "'and he didn't want to go no deeper, "'didn't want to rob a lot of orphans of everything they had. "'Why, how you talk?' says the King. "'We shan't rob them of nothing at all but just this money. "'The people that buys the property is the sufferers, "'because as soon as it's found out that we didn't own it, "'which won't be long after we've slid,' The sale won't be valid, and it'll all go back to the estate. These your orphans will get their house back again, and that's enough for them. They're young and spry, and can easily earn a living. They ain't a-going to suffer. Why, just think, there's thousands and thousands that ain't nigh so well off. Bless you, they ain't got nothing to complain of. Well, the king, he talked him blind, so at last he give in, and said all right. "'but said he believed it was blamed foolishness to stay, "'and that doctor hanging over them. "'But the king says, "'Cuss the doctor! What do we care for him? "'Ain't we got all the fools in town on our side? "'And ain't that a big enough majority in any town?' "'So they got ready to go downstairs again. "'The duke says, "'I don't think we put that money in a good place.' "'That cheered me up. "'I'd begun to think I weren't going to get a hint of no kind to help me.' The king says, Why? Because Mary Jane'll be in mourning from this out, 
and first you know, the nigger that does up the rooms will get an order to box these duds up and put em away. And do you reckon a nigger can run across money and not borrow some of it? Your head's level again, Duke, says the king, and he comes a fumbling under the curtain two or three foot from where I was. I stuck tight to the wall and kept mighty still, though quivery, and I wondered what them fellers would say if they catched me, and I tried to think what I'd better do if they did catch me. But the king, he got the bag before I could think more than about a half a thought, and he never suspicioned I was around. They took and shoved the bag through a rip in the straw tick that was under the feather bed, and crammed it in a foot or two amongst the straw, and said it was all right now, because a nigger only makes up the feather bed, and don't turn over the straw tick only about twice a year, and so it warn't no danger of getting stole now. But I knowed better. I had it out of there before they was halfway downstairs. I groped along up to my cubby, and hid it there till I could get a chance to do better. I judged I'd better hide it outside of the house somewheres, because if they missed it, they would give the house a good ransacking. I know that very well. Then I turned in, with my clothes all on, but I couldn't have gone to sleep if I'd wanted to. I was in such a sweat to get through with the business. By and by, I heard the king and the duke come up, so I rolled off my pallet and laid with my chin at the top of my ladder and waited to see if anything was going to happen. But nothing did. So I held on till all the late sounds had quit and the early ones hadn't begun yet, and then I slipped down the ladder. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in April 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 27 I crept to their doors and listened. They was snoring, so I tiptoed along and got downstairs all right. There warn't a sound anywheres. I peeped through a crack of the dining room door and see the men that was watching the corpse all sound asleep on their chairs. The door was open into the parlor where the corpse was laying, and there was a candle in both rooms. I passed along, and the parlor door was open, but I see there warn't nobody in there but the remainders of Peter. So I shoved on by, but the front door was locked, and the key wasn't there. Just then I heard somebody coming down the stairs back behind me. I run in the parlor and took a swift look around, and the only place I see to hide the bag was in the coffin. The lid was shoved along about a foot, showing the dead man's face down in there with a wet cloth over it and his shroud on. I tucked the money bag in under the lid, just down beyond where his hands was crossed, which made me creep they was so cold. And then I run back across the room and in behind the door. The person coming was Mary Jane. She went to the coffin very soft and kneeled down and looked in. Then she put up her handkerchief and I see she begun to cry, though I couldn't hear her and her back was to me. I slid out and as I passed the dining room, I thought I'd make sure them watchers hadn't seen me, so I looked through the crack, and everything was all right. They hadn't stirred. I slipped up to bed, feeling rather blue, on accounts of the thing playing out that way, after I had took so much trouble and run so much risk about it. Says I, if it could stay where it is, all right, because when we get down the river a hundred mile or two, I could ride back to Mary Jane, and she could dig him up again and get it. But that ain't the thing that's going to happen. The thing that's going to happen is the money'll be found when they come to screw on the lid. Then the king'll get it again, and it'll be a long day before he gives anybody another chance to smouch it from him. Of course, I wanted to slide down and get it out of there, but I dasn't try it. Every minute it was getting earlier now, and pretty soon some of them watchers would begin to stir, and I might get catched. Catch with six thousand dollars in my hands that nobody hadn't hired me to take care of. I don't wish to be mixed up in no such business as that, I says to myself. When I got downstairs in the morning, the parlor was shut up, 
and the watchers was gone. There weren't nobody round but the family and the widow Bartley in our tribe. I watched their faces to see if anything had been happening, but I couldn't tell. Towards the middle of the day, the undertaker come with his man, and they set the coffin in the middle of the room on a couple of chairs, and then set all our chairs in a row, and borrowed more from the neighbors, till the hall and the parlor and the dining room was full. I see the coffin lid was the way it was before, but I dasn't go to look in under it with folks around. Then the people began to flock in, and the beats and the girl took seats in the front row at the head of the coffin, and for a half an hour the people filed around slow in single rank, and looked down at the dead man's face a minute, and some dropped in a tear, and it was all very still and solemn, only the girls and the beats holding handkerchiefs to their eyes and keeping their heads bent and sobbing a little. There weren't no other sound but the scraping of the feet on the floor and blowing noses, because people always blows them more at a funeral than they do at other places, except church. When the place was packed full, the undertaker, he slid around in his black gloves with his softy soothering ways, putting on the last touches, and getting people and things all ship-shape and comfortable, and making no more sound than a cat. He never spoke. He moved people around, he squeezed in late ones, he opened up passageways and done it with nods and signs with his hands. Then he took his place over against the wall. He was the softest, glidingest, stealthiest man I ever see, and there weren't no more smile to him than there is to a ham. They had borrowed a melodium, a sick one, and when everything was ready a young woman sat down and worked it, and it was pretty screaky and colicky, and everybody joined in and sung, and Peter was the only one that had a good thing, according to my notion. Then the Reverend Hobson opened up, slow and solemn, and begun to talk, and straight off the most outrageous row busted out in the cellar a body ever heard. It was only one dog, but he made a most powerful racket, and he kept it up right along. The parson, he had to stand there over the coffin and wait. You couldn't hear yourself think. It was right down awkward, and nobody didn't seem to know what to do. But pretty soon they see that long-legged undertaker make a sign to the preacher, as much as to say, Don't you worry, just depend on me. Then he stooped down and begun to glide along the wall, just his shoulders showing over the people's heads. So he glided along, and the pow-wow and racket getting more and more outrageous all the time. And at last, when he had gone around two sides of the room, he disappears down the cellar. Then in about two seconds we heard a whack, and the dog he finished up with a most amazing howl or two, and then everything was dead still, and the parson begun his solemn talk where he left off. In a minute or two, here comes this undertaker's back and shoulders gliding along the wall again, and so he glided and glided around three sides of the room, and then rose up and shaded his mouth with his hands and stretched his neck out towards the preacher over the people's heads and says in a kind of a coarse whisper, He had a rat! Then he drooped down and glided along the wall again to his place. You could see it was a great satisfaction to the people, because naturally they wanted to know. A little thing like that don't cost nothing, and it's just the little things that makes a man to be looked up to and liked. There weren't no more popular man in town than what that undertaker was. Well, the funeral sermon was very good, but pissin' long and tiresome. And then the king, he shoved in and got off some of his usual rubbish, and at last the job was through, and the undertaker begun to sneak up on the coffin with his screwdriver. I was in a sweat then, and watched him pretty keen, but he never meddled at all, just slid the lid along as soft as mush, and screwed it down tight and fast. So there I was. I didn't know whether the money was in there or not. So, says I, suppose somebody has hogged that bag on the sly. Now how do I know whether to write to Mary Jane or not? Suppose she dug him up and didn't find nothing. What would she think of me? Blame it, I says, I might get hunted up and jailed. 
I'd better lay low and keep dark, and not ride at all. The thing's awful mixed now. Trying to better it, I've worsened it a hundred times. And I wish to goodness I'd just let it alone. Dad fetched the whole business. They buried him, and we come back home, and I went to watching faces again. I couldn't help it, and I couldn't rest easy. But nothing come of it. The faces didn't tell me nothing. The king, he visited round in the evening and sweetened everybody up, and made himself ever so friendly, and he gave out the idea that his congregation over in England would be in a sweat about him, so he must hurry and settle up the estate right away and leave for home. He was very sorry he was so pushed, and so was everybody. They wished he could stay longer, but they said they could see it couldn't be done. And he said, of course, him and William would take the girls home with them. And that pleased everybody, too, because then the girls would be well fixed, and amongst their own relations. And it pleased the girls, too. Tickled them so they clean forgot they ever had a trouble in the world, and told him to sell out as quick as he wanted to. They would be ready. Them poor things was that glad and happy, it made my heart ache to see them getting fooled and lied to so. "'but I didn't see no safe way for me to chip in and change the general tune. "'Well, blamed if the king didn't build a house and the niggers and all the property for auction straight off, "'sail two days after the funeral, but anybody could buy private beforehand if they wanted to. "'So the next day after the funeral, long about noontime, the girl's joy got the first jolt.' A couple of nigger traders come along, and the king sold them the niggers reasonable, for three days' drafts, as they call it, and away they went, the two sons up the river to Memphis, and their mother down the river to Orleans. I thought them poor girls and them niggers would break their hearts for grief. They cried round each other, and took on so, it must made me down sick to see it. The girls said they had never dreamed of seeing the family separated, or sold away from the town. I can't ever get it out of my memory, the sight of them poor miserable girls and niggers hanging around each other's necks and crying, and I reckon I couldn't have stood it at all, but would have had to bust out and tell on our gang, if I hadn't knowed the sale weren't no account, and the niggers would be back home in a week or two. The thing made a big stir in the town, too, and a good many come out flat-footed, and said it was scandalous to separate the mother and the children that way. It injured the fraud some, but the old fool, he bowled right along, spite of all the duke could say or do, and I tell you the duke was powerful uneasy. Next day was auction day. About broad day in the morning the duke and the king come up in the garret and woke me up, and I see by their look that there was trouble. The king says, "'Was you in my room night before last?' "'No, your majesty,' which was the way I always called him when nobody but our gang weren't around. "'Was you in there yesterday or last night?' "'No, your majesty.' "'Honor bright now, no lies.' "'Honor bright, your majesty, I'm telling you the truth. "'I hain't been a near your room since Miss Mary Jane took you and the duke and showed it to you.' "'The duke says,' "'Have you seen anybody else go in there?' "'No, your grace, not as I remember, I believe. "'Stop and think. "'I studied a while and see my chance. "'Then I says, "'Well, I see the niggers go in there several times. "'Both of them gave a little jump "'and looked like they hadn't ever expected it, "'and then like they had. "'Then the duke says, "'What, all of them?' "'No, leastways not all at once, that is. "'I don't think I ever saw them all come out at once, but just one time. "'Hello, when was that?' "'It was the day we had the funeral, in the morning. "'It weren't early, because I overslept. "'I was just starting down the ladder, and I see them. "'Well, go on, go on. "'What did they do? "'How'd they act?' They didn't do nothing, and they didn't act any way much, as far as I can see. They tiptoed away, so I seen easy enough that they'd shoved in there to do up your majesty's room or something, supposing you was up, 
and found you warmed up, and so they was hoping to slide out of the way of trouble without waking you up, if they hadn't already waked you up. "'Great guns! This is a go!' says the king, and both of them looked pretty sick and tolerable silly. They stood there a-thinking and scratching their heads a minute, and the duke he bust into a kind of a little raspy chuckle, and says, "'It does beat all how neat the niggers played their hand. They lit on to be sorry they was going out of this region, and I believe they was sorry, and so did you, and so did everybody.' Don't ever tell me any more that a nigger ain't got no histrionic talent. Why, the way they played that thing, it would fool anybody. In my opinion, there's a fortune in em. If I had capital and a theater, I wouldn't want a better layout than that. And here we've gone and sold em for a song. Yes, and ain't privileged to sing the song yet. Say... Where is that song, that draft? In the bank to be collected. Where would it be? Well, that's all right, then. Thank goodness. Says I, kind of timid-like, Is something gone wrong? The king whirls on me and rips out, None of your business. You keep your head shut and mind your own affairs if you got any. Long as you're in this town, don't you forget that, you hear? Then he says to the duke, We got to just swallow it and say nothing. Mum's the word for us. As they was starting down the ladder, the duke, he chuckles again and says, Quick sales and small profits. It's a good business, yes. The king snarls around on him and says, I was trying to do for the best in selling them out so quick. If the profits had turned out to be none, lacking considerable, and none to carry, is it my fault any more than it's yourn? Well, they'd be in this house yet, and we wouldn't, if I could have got my advice listened to. The king sassed back as much as was safe for him, and then swapped around and lit into me again. He gave me down the banks for not coming and telling him I see the niggers coming out of his room acting that way said any fool would a knowed something was up, and then waltzed in and cussed himself a while, and said it all come of him not laying late, and taking his natural rest that morning, and he'd be blamed if he'd ever do it again. So they went off a jawin', and I felt dreadful glad I'd worked it all off on the niggers, and yet hadn't done the niggers no harm by it. End of chapter 27